Intermittent fasting impacts weight loss, fat loss in particular, muscle maintenance and loss and gain, organ health, inflammation, sickness, recovery, and healing from sickness, exercise, cognition, mood, and lifespan. Time-restricted feeding, it's very clear from both animal studies and human studies, can have a very powerful and positive impact on everything from weight loss and fat loss to various health parameters. What you'll see is that there actually is a perfect diet for you on a given day. And that perfect diet for you on a given day is contextual, meaning it depends on what you did yesterday and what you're going to do tomorrow. If I can emphasize anything today, it's that what you eat and when you eat it set conditions in your body. And those conditions can be very good for you or very bad for you, depending on when you eat. In fact, when you eat is as important as what you eat. I'll repeat that. When you eat is as important as what you eat. Think of it this way. Blood sugar and insulin go up when you eat. They go down when you don't eat. And other hormones go up when you don't eat. So there are hormones associated with the fasted state. And there are hormones associated with the eating and having just eaten state. Now, the most important thing to understand is that insulin and glucose go up when we eat and it takes some period of time for them to go down. Even if we stop eating, they will remain up for some period of time and then go back down. It takes time. This is very important because if you look at the scientific literature on fasting, it's absolutely clear that the health benefits, not just the weight loss benefits, but that the health benefits from time-restricted feeding occur because certain conditions are met in the brain and body for a certain amount of time. And that gives us an anchor from which to view what eating is in terms of how it sets conditions in the body over time. Now, an important point about when the feeding window falls within the 24-hour cycle. It is very important that the feeding window fall during the more active phase of one's day. So for humans, that's typically in the early part of the day or the later part of the day, but not at night. Put very simply, there are a lot of data now pointing to the fact that eating during the nocturnal phase of the 24-hour cycle is very detrimental to one's health. In this study, they saw something really interesting, which was that not only did restricting food to a particular phase of the 24-hour cycle benefit things like lean body mass, and fat loss and a number of health parameters that I'll talk about in a moment, but it also anchored all the gene systems of the body and provided a more regular, stable, so-called circadian rhythm or 24-hour rhythm. This has now also been shown to be true for humans. So if you want to be healthy, you want your organ health, your metabolic health to be entrained properly, one of the most important things you can do is to eat at the appropriate time of each 24-hour day. The short takeaway from this is you probably want to think about and perhaps even engage in time-restricted feeding. One of the key pillars of intermittent fasting is that for the first hour after you wake up and potentially for longer to not ingest any food. The second major pillar that's well supported by research is that for the two and ideally three hours prior to bedtime, you also don't ingest any food or liquid calories for that matter. It's very clear from the research in humans that not eating any food or ingesting any calories, liquid or otherwise, for the first 60 minutes after waking up each day and for the two to three hours prior to your bedtime, that's ideal for the parameters that we've discussed earlier. The two most common questions about intermittent fasting are when is the ideal time for the eating window? Is it early in the day, the middle of the day, or later in the day? And how long should that eating window be? So let's deal with this first question of when is the ideal feeding window? So it turns out that the answer to the question, when is it best to eat, is actually best answered by thinking about the other side of the coin, which is when is it best to fast? Because we are fasting during sleep, it's very clear that it's best to extend the sleep-related fast either into the morning or to start it in the evening. When we sleep, our body undergoes a number of different processes in the brain and body in order to recover the cells and tissues. Many of you have probably heard of autophagy, which is essentially a cleaning up, a gobbling up of dead cells and cells that are injured or sick. And this is a natural process that occurs and it occurs mainly during sleep, although not only during sleep. Fasting of any kind does tend to enhance autophagy. 
So you're already fasting when you're asleep and how deep you are into that fast depends on how long it was since your last meal. So if you fast early in the day and you've been asleep for five, six, seven, eight hours, I would hope somewhere between six and eight hours for most people is going to be beneficial. I mentioned earlier that you don't want to eat for at least the first 60 minutes after waking, but were you to extend that fasting to say, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., or even 12 noon or later, you are taking advantage of the deep fast that you were in during sleep and certainly toward the end of sleep. So one thing is certain, that you want your eating window to be tacked or attached to your sleep-based fasting in a way that makes it easier for you to get into the fasted state for a period of time. So if you are like most people and you sleep at night, you're waking up somewhere around 6.30, 7 a.m. or maybe even 8 a.m. Let's say you were to push your fasting window out such that you started eating at noon and then you stopped eating at 6 p.m. Well, then you're not eating from 6 p.m. until let's say your bedtime is 10 p.m. But from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., your body is not yet in a fasted state because you just ate. However, you're starting to taper into a fasted state before sleep and then all through sleep and until the next morning and late morning, you are actually in a fasted state. You may have heard the old adage that if you take a 20 or 30 minute walk after dinner, that it accelerates the rate at which you digest that food. And indeed it does. Clearing out of glucose from your system can be accomplished through a number of different means, but light movement or exercise does increase gastric emptying time. So for instance, if you were to eat a meal that ended at 8 p.m. and then plop to the couch, watch TV or get on your computer or go to sleep, it would be five or six hours until you have transitioned from a fed state to a fasted state. However, you can accelerate that considerably by taking a 20 or 30 minute just light walk. It doesn't have to be speed walking. It certainly doesn't have to be jogging, but just walking outside or moving around. So glucose clearing is an important aspect of the transition from the fed state to the fasted state. And just a light walk can allow you to do that. It's not really about when you eat and what you do. It's about extending the duration of the fasting period as long as you can in a way that's still compatible with your eating. There are, of course, other patterns of feeding. And while some people have engaged in longer fasts of 24 hours, 36 hours or more, alternate day fasting, meaning eating one day, not eating the next day, or in some cases eating one day and eating very few calories, 500 or 600 calories the next day, has been tested. A few studies have also looked at eating a sort of maintenance level of calories for five days and then taking two days and fasting clear through or eating very few calories, you know, 300 or 500 calories. But alternate day fasting has gotten the so-called safe bill of health. This has been written up, meaning that people didn't suffer bone loss. They didn't suffer any major detrimental effects. It does seem that it can create significant weight loss and can help with obese individuals, that it can reduce resting blood glucose. And every other day fasting, in many cases, can produce more rapid effects on weight loss and reductions in blood glucose than time-restricted feeding. One of the more hot-button issues out there is whether or not given equal amounts of caloric intake and equal amounts of activity and equal amounts of nutrients, etc., whether or not restricting food to a particular window biases more weight loss toward fat loss versus loss of other tissues. Because of course, when we lose weight, we can lose that from any number of different storage sites within the body, muscle, water, glycogen, or fat. This is covered in the review that I mentioned earlier that describes how if people follow a time-restricted feeding schedule for long periods of time, so 60 days or longer, there's some metabolic changes in the way that people metabolize energy that do seem to shift the system toward more fat loss relative to burning of other tissues when in a state of caloric restriction. In states of caloric restriction, meaning sub-maintenance intake, time-restricted feeding does seem to bias more of the energy burned to compensate for that deficit from fat. This logically points to a case in which using time-restricted feeding with a subcaloric intake seems to be, at least to my mind, the most scientifically supported way to ensure that a significant portion of the weight that one loses is from body fat stores.